an interesting thing that I was reading, and I I was really blown away. There is one of the oldest churches in the world is in Jebel. It belong. It's around the fourth century. Still there today. Yes. How much of Saudi would you say is unexcavated? Eighty percent, if not more, because we also need to keep. We have we have the empty quarter, for example. Five thousand years ago, seven thousand years ago, it wasn't a desert. There was a lake, and there was civilizations that lived there. And also, most importantly, what we shouldn't forget is ancient inscriptions. Anywhere you would go in the desert, you would find ancient inscriptions. Today, when I get to see, you know, now, you know, you have female archaeologists, and they're working every yani in every part in Saudi. And it's alhamdulillah something amazing for me to see because what's normal to them was impossible for me. Amazing coffee. The best. You're actually <laughs> bad. Like you had one on your way. Yeah, oh, in the morning. God, they're gonna love hearing that. Well, that's to good. be like the end credits, you know, the bloopers <laughs> or Bismillah rahman rahim Welcome to uh, a new episode of the Mo Show podcast. Uh, I have uh, a very unique person. You can call it niche uh, by virtue of what it is she does. She is uh, Saudi's one of Saudi's first, if not first. Can we can we claim that Saudi's first female archaeologist? Uh, I have no idea, so I'm not going to take full credit for it. So let's say one of the few. So one of the few comes out smart, yeah. Because I get asked that a lot. Are you Saudi Arabia's first English podcast? I'm like, no one has challenged me, but yeah. in case someone was there before me, I don't want to claim it. I don't care if I'm the first. I don't think you care if you're the first. But not at all, honestly, as long as I get, m- the most important thing is I get the message through. Message. Regardless. So if there's someone before me or inshallah, I hope after me there's uh, hundreds of uh, future female archaeologists in Saudi Arabia and uh, nothing makes me more happy than to see them. Yeah. Wow, me and you have a lot to talk about because I couldn't have said it better myself. It's, it's, it's not about being first, second or last. It's about spreading the message. Uh, spreading the word and, and and my god is there a lot of content for a me to spread about saudi and in your field to spread about archaeology archaeology is 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 a rich subject in saudi that is probably unbeknownst to many people right uh, exactly you know i always say as they say and you know, i say it as well as you know you always try to be who you needed when you were younger even if you're young at your career or regardless at an age so for me when i start started studying archaeology I had no one to go to to ask who had similar experiences in Saudi, because when someone is in your country, uh, you can go for tips and advices. And I did not have that. So for me to be able to be that person for the younger generation or the new aspiring archaeologist, nothing makes me more happy than to provide tips and tricks. That's pretty cool. That really is cool. Um, a nice open-ended question to kick off here, Hassa. Um, why is it that you do what you do? Ever since I can remember, Everything, you know, since my childhood, I would, I was always outdoors, and I always had a stick. And I know whenever we'd go in winter to the desert, I would try to find something. And uh, my mother at the time, she paused from studying after she had me and my brother, and then she continued. So I was probably eight or nine years old, and she was studying. Uh, she was studying interior design at New Haven's University in New York, but she was taking her classes in in Riyadh to be around me and my brother. And whenever I would come back from school, I would throw my bag, I would knock on her study room and I would ask if I can join. And she would tell me, yeah, but you have to be quiet and if you have any questions, just raise your hand. I remember once I was drawing and then uh, and then I looked at this beautiful building and I said, remember these old projectors where you had to put the, oh, uh, the slide? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah. So each side, they go around you know, in a circle, <laughs> like a, yeah, like a. And when you press it, the whole entire world knows you're doing for you know you're using yeah. it. So I remember I just looked uh, at the slide, and then it was this magnificent building, and I just looked at my mother. Said, "Oh, well, where is it?" I assumed it's new, Yanni, because as a child, if th- something is old, it's broken, you throw it. And she told me it was like hundreds or thousands of years ago. I forgot which building it was, but I remember it was in Italy. And I was amazed, and I asked again. I was like, "But it's, but it's, uh, it looks new. I don't see it anymore. I mean, nowadays you don't see it." And then she said, "If you have any question, just ask the professor." And I asked her, and she answered. And I was always welcome to join the class. So my mother was the person, honestly, who noticed my interest in that field, 
And I do it right now, honestly, and I speak a lot about it in my social media to spread more awareness about what we have in Saudi and how rich our kingdom is in that field. And the history we have, and it goes to as simple as our current uh, history of Saudi Arabia. You know, Saudi is not a new country, as people might assume, eight years of history. We have the first Saudi state, we have the second, and we have the current. And 300 years of history, it was established in 1727. So even our current history is not known to the world, let's say. And it goes to as simple as this to one million years ago, I would speak. <laughs> I mean, the first touchdown on Arabia back then, or the first time there was civilization on what is modern day Saudi Arabia, was about a million years ago. Okay, so I was looking, I had this book forever, and just recently I started to open it to really read into it. And then they had this picture that they redid how Saudi used to look like. And it was around one million years ago in Wadi and Sah and around Riyadh. It was tropical. You know, three of the largest rivers compared to the rivers we have today used to cross Saudi Arabia. And the first thing a human needs for, for them to settle is you need food, shelter, and water. And this is what Saudi did provide. And what's interesting is... Oh, uh, so it was a warm uh, environment. And what's interesting about it, and this is why I love what I do, because, you know, you read these these artifacts when you see it, and they give you a lot also about the environment information. So they found suddenly a sudden increase in using lithic tools to cut leather, which indicates that the weather started to get colder. And this is where the weather started to change and it became less and less uh, rain, and then it became more of a deserted area. But it took, obviously, a long time for this to reach. So this is some things when I read it as a, you know, artifacts can give you so much information. Totally, so much information. But it's, it's definitely common knowledge with the ice ages uh, and the changing climates of regions. The southern hemisphere becomes like what's Antarctica and the North Pole today was probably one day tropical. Everything depends, you know, when you, and it starts from millions and hundreds of millions of years ago. And for each environment, there's a certain time that uh, it looked like and how the environment changed. But every change takes millions of years to, for it to happen. And in that, in that phase, this is why humans migrate if the, this part becomes dry and it becomes cold and there's no food or shelter, so they start to migrate to different uh, uh, locations. And this is when humans started to uh, to plant and they, they discovered that this is when they started to set it, to build. And this is also interesting because, you know, one simple, one person, you know, when they discovered how to plant and to have their own food, this is where the settlement started because they were always looking for it. So you just stumbled upon this career. It wasn't like something that you took a keen interest on when you were younger. Uh, I honestly, to be completely honest, I didn't even know it existed. Yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> At, <laughs> until the age of what did you know of its existence? So there's actually one turning point in my life that I had this feeling uh, that I just loved uh, archaeology, but because I, obviously at that time I didn't know it was archaeology. We were visiting Greece and we were in Athens and we were at the Acropolis mountain and we were staying, we were staring at the temple of Athena. And the only logical explanation that came to me, I told my mother, oh, so the giants built this. She said, no, she just looked at me. And the, what I love about my mother, she never spoke to me as a child, regardless of, uh, my mother never spoke to me as a child, regardless of, uh, of any question that I would ask. And she told me, no, it's people like me and you. And I said, that doesn't make sense. How can they move this? And then she told me, if you have any question, just ask the tour guide. And then he, when he told me the information about ancient Greek history, and I was simply blown away. So I said, okay, so these people were advanced much, much more than we think. And at the same day, or the day after, we went to a rooftop cinema, and the movie was Tomb Raider. 
And I was blown away. So you see her protecting the artifacts not to go to the bad people. And I said, and then I look at the movie and then I look at the temple and I said, I want to be Laura Croft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the thing is, she wasn't an art coach. I believe her dad was. I haven't seen it in forever. So then I, when I finished high school, I, I was talking to my mother. I said, Khalas, you know, I'm just going to do business or I don't know. And then she said, don't, you know, whatever you choose right now defines your future. And I told Ria, if I don't like it, I'll change. I'm, I take things very easily. You know, I never stress. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And I remember she looked at me and she said, Hessa, why don't you study archaeology? And I said, does that exist? Mm-hmm. And, she, and I thought it was my hobby. And she said, yeah. And in the same week, she booked me a flight to Amman and I went to Jordan and the rest is history. <laughs> And that's where you studied it uh, on a college or yeah. college level? Yeah, I went to University of Jordan. This is where I took my uh, bachelor. Wow, interesting. <clears throat> well, I guess, I mean, for people who aren't aware of what archaeology is, they're probably getting the gist of it now with what you're talking about. Um, in in a few sentences, how do you, scru- how do you describe the, the field? So basically with archaeology, what you do, what we do is we study humans based on the artifacts they leave behind. And what's beautiful about archaeology, it's like an umbrella and you study architecture, you study art, you study the environment, anything that involves the human. And you don't study one famous leader or a king, you study the entire society. And this is what's beautiful about it. Um, it's uh, It's way more than 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 meets the eye, you know, because first of all, it covers the whole globe. It's not something that is confined to one region. How rich is the Middle East, or let's say, where is the richest place to discover artifacts and archaeo- archaeological findings? I would say on the Middle East, most of it is discovered and they've excavated enough on it. But to me, what I find interesting is Saudi Arabia. Because, you know, when you look at the Saudi map, it was very interesting because it connected the east to the west. We had the incense roads and many others. Saudi had different civilizations, different kingdoms. You have the Dadan kingdom, the Hyan kingdom. You know, you have uh, Babylon settlements, Assyrian settlements, uh, Roman settlements, Nabataean settlements, Qidar kingdom. Uh, and, them, and also, most importantly, what we shouldn't forget is ancient inscriptions. Anywhere you would go in the desert, you would find ancient inscriptions, such as Hayyad, you have this open library of inscriptions that dates to 10,000 years, and it has three periods of history. And whenever you walk through Jubba Mountains, it's fascinating. So even in outside of Riyadh, actually, there's this location called Graffiti Rock. You have Neolithic or Calculithic time. Uh, you have uh, inscriptions of it, which dates to 5,000 to 4,000 years of history. And you have also Islamic history as, uh, as you walk through the deserts. So it's very rich and I'm very excited, inshallah, yani, when let's say more excavations happen on a larger scale. I do believe Saudi would discover new civilizations and we would lo- unlock hopefully, and this is something that I'm very interested in, interested in is human migration from Africa to Arabia in Saudi. So this is something I think for sure we will find some new evidence. How much of Saudi would you say is unexcavated? 80% if not more. Because we also need to keep, we have, we have the empty quarter for example. 5,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago it wasn't a desert. There was a lake and there were civilizations that lived there. And also, again, all of the deserted areas do not look like what we know of today. As well as, for example, you have in Tema, you have in al you have in Riyadh, you have in in Asir, in Hayr, you know, every part in Saudi Arabia, you have in al The amount of history we have is unbelievable. And was through, you know, the thing is, any excavation they do, they do find something. Any excavation they do, they do uncover secrets and history and things that would unlock. And it's like a puzzle. Just between Khaybar and al Ula, they've done this aerial survey and ground survey, and they've uh, they've uh, found 130,000 archaeological sites in that area. It's an area known for battles as well. 
Yeah, many of even the, in the Islamic period, very famous battles happened here. And when you, was, was. yeah, you, it happened here. And when you would ask people in certain areas about it, they would tell you it happened in this location. It happened in this location. And also in each area, the people who live there, mashallah, yani they're full of knowledge, the history of the region. 80% you say, t- talk to me about al Jof because I feel that al Jof's identity uh, or a big part of its identity is what it is you study. Is it one of the richer areas in our, in our country? I, w- uh, I believe every part is very rich because we can. I cannot say because, again, a lot of uh, locations have not been excavated yet. But what I, what I would say about al Jof is that is very interesting is Qidar Kingdom. Not enough studies or excavations have been done there. And to me personally, you know, Qidar Kingdom had one of the, Qidar Kingdom had Arab queens, such as Queen uh, Queen Shamsi, Queen Zabiba. And what's interesting about it is around 853 BC, when they lost the battle of Qarqar with King Shalmanasr III, and, and the Assyrian king, when he documented his victory, he said, uh, that he defeated K- uh, King Jandibu of Arabia. This is the oldest word until today of Arabs that has ever been, ever been documented, and it's referred to Qidar Kingdom. <laughs> Is there a mission or a plan to start excavating more of Saudi? I do. I think I'm not sure because it's in the 2030 vision. The focus is on tourism, and for in order to to have more tourists, you also need to expose what you have more. I think it is part of it to do more excavations, but honestly, I'm not. I have no idea. I don't work with them. With um, with uh, I believe it belongs to the commission of uh, the heritage commission, right? Yeah, um, it under Ministry of Culture for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The reason why I ask that is because with history or artifacts or proof of things that were here from a long, long time ago, if you think about it, that's what tourists leave their home country to go see. They want it. There is such a big interest and a huge pull in what was life like back in the day, well before our time? Yeah. Why do people go to Italy? Why do people go to Athens? Why do people from all over the world go to the Great Pyramids of Giza? You know, something very interesting I find in Saudi is, you know, for example, most countries are being visited because they have one famous civilization. We have many. Yeah. You know, we have the Dan only that exists here. We have Lihian, we have Qidar Kingdom. Yeah, I mean, the capital was here. We did it. It did expand to other countries, but the capital was here in Saudi. So imagine the experience a tourist gets to have in one place and see. I'm not saying speaking about settlements that they expanded. This is only here. So imagine, yeah, I mean, the experience. How and so this is something you will never see anywhere, and only in Saudi. It's interesting because yeah, you are getting kind of like a a, a three three or four or five civil- civilizations in one kind of deal. Yeah. Um, and that makes it unique in its own right. It's a package. It's a package <laughs> deal. Yeah, it's a package deal. Um, wow, that really, no, no, I mean, there is, again, like, I just can't help but think how rich the archaeological world is over here and we barely scratch the surface. Yeah. And imagine, even just a few days ago, what's interesting now in archaeology there is this thing called space archaeology where they get to see and try to discover more locations and deserted locations through satellite images, which is, I believe, Laura Croft would do something like this, you know. <laughs> Tomb Raider. <laughs> yeah. So they found here in uh, Oxford University found uh, where the where the military camp for the Romans were. So that they believe this until now it's not uh, been excavated. But they believe this is when the Romans took over the Nabataean kingdoms in 107 AD. And this is something recently, this year, they've uh, they've uh, discovered it. So imagine the rest of the deserts. 
The thing is, if something in archaeology, if something is recent, sometimes you do have obvious uh, things that would tell you, such as collapsed buildings, or sometimes you would see it on the surface. But it, what's hard is mostly prehistoric ages that go to the Stone Age. And interesting thing that I was reading, and I I was really blown away. There is one of the oldest churches in the world is in Jebel. It belong. It's around the fourth century. Still there today. Yes. It's, it, it's, it, I believe it was restored, I'm not sure, but I think it, because when they found it, it was only the roof that collapsed, uh, which is obvious because it's usually made from wood and it, with time it does collapse. And they found Islamic pottery and they did not turn it into a mosque or anything. They lived in peace. I think it, it was during the Abbasi period, or as, but I, it's either Abbasi or Amal, but I think it's Abbasi period. So, and it still exists until today, no one has tampered with it, no one has done anything to it. Are, are proof of all of what you just said available for people to see today? I honestly don't know because my grandmother is from that area and my cousin, so they, and there's a lot of beautiful mythological stories in that area. Even there's the, there's the rock, you know, that it's cut in the middle. It has a story, but I forgot it. went viral on Instagram recently. Really? Yeah, yeah. It has a... a gap in between. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. almost done by laser. And yeah. I was just in the comment section of that and everyone was like, there is no way on earth that that just has happened by chance over time. It's It really looks like some alien ship, you know, shot it with a laser that just gave a perfect yeah. symmetrical slice through a huge 50 meter or 50 foot rockets. It's it's insane that that's something I'm definitely going to put up right now on the episode. You can see the... It's yeah, but but I believe it's cut for natural reasons. It's not like... Uh, to me how bad. I, don't, I was reading actually about it recently. I was, uh, there was, uh, I believe there was a Saudi geologist who posts about uh, these kind of uh, things in Saudi, you know, the, the natural wonders of Saudi. And he was speaking about this, that it was natural. I don't honestly have much information, but I do remember my my great uncle was speaking to us. He was telling us a story about it that involved, I believe, the moon and the sun, but it was a mythological story. But in general, Al Ula is very famous, and you know, and I hope like, one day, you know, inshallah, I get to share it with the world, and I'll do something inshallah with it. But it's a you know, it's filled with history, whether it's with the heritage side of it or the ancient side of it. And the, at some point, there's a woman that used to tell me that she lived in the tombs. Come on. I swear to God, my grandmother saw her. I think it was through my grandmother's generation and she had her sheep with her. She just lived in there, rent-free? Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't? You know? <laughs> what a story. So it's called the Al-Nasla Nasla rock. It's made up of two sandstones supported by a naturally formed pedestal with a perfect slice down the middle or slit down the middle. With the exact cause of the split has yet to be determined, wind blown in sand and periodic rain could have created the unusual shape. It's, it really is, uh, it's just, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, it's crazy. You look at that, uh, we'll, we'll put it up on the screen again now if we haven't already. It's It looks like an artistic masterpiece. Exactly. I mean, nothing should be cut like that. It just doesn't make sense. I, I think it was it was laser from an alien ship. But I'll tell you, because if you look at the edges, you know, it, it looks to me, you know, I can honestly, I would believe it's it's natural because you would see it around the world. I mean, I don't have much uh, knowledge about geology and how rocks are form formated. Okay, but you've seen enough rocks to, to, to give your opinion on it. I do believe it's natural, you know. Now, because... forget about the edges, the middle. The middle is, is almost like it's sanded down to perfection. Uh, I still believe. But, you know, if... I mean, if someone would voluntarily go excavate there to tell us, you know, yeah. the, the truth, if they find any artifacts, we might, <laughs> you know, and see the debate if it was yeah. humans or natural. But so far, I, you know, they say it's natural. This is part of the area that is now obviously preserved. Because you can see the, the bottom. If it was not natural by humans, they would have started, you know, they would have done, done something for the bottom. So they would move it or you would have seen signs because when humans... Uh, Car, they would tie themselves so you would see a ho some holes around the, uh, the like it would be around the left and the right until the the top also in Petra for example if you would uh, sorry in uh, Lula if you would see in uh, on the tombs on the right side you would see holes 
And this is where the, when they used to build it, they would tie themselves because they started from top to bottom. And until today, you would see, see it where they used to tie themselves. It's like when, you know, when they clean the, the windows. Windows. Yeah, yeah. it's almost like that. you're abseiling down. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy that they knew of such a solution to do their work uh, via abseiling down. Like it's pretty crazy that back in those times, they, they had the level of intellect to say that this is the way to do it. But keep in mind, Lula uh, is around, you know, it started, it ended around 106, the Nabataean Empire. It didn't last, it lasted for a couple of years. But what's mind blowing, blowing I find, is in Al Jo, the camel carving, if you've ever heard about it. No, tell me. It was recently discovered a few years ago. And what they found it, it's what's important about it is that they, it's the largest actual size carving. Of, an, of a camel known until today in the world, and it's the oldest. What's amazing about it is it's carved on a mountain, and it's from the, I believe, the Neolithic period, which is, it's dated around 5,700 to 5,400 BC. And what, what that gives us an idea of that there were people, you know, and that, uh, yeah. This is the, no, no, look at the, the full. Uh... Yeah, I saw it actually in the, let me just do this. Yes, this one here. This one. Yeah. Actually get a better picture of it. Clearly the camel yeah. on the, on the rock. And, and that's definitely man-made. Yeah. And because what's interesting is they found the tools they used to carve it. Oh no way! Yeah, they found it on the site, and this is the uh, the oldest actual size carving in the world, dated to that period. They never knew humans could build something as magnificent as this. We can only imagine when they first finished it how it looked like. I mean, today we're blown away. So imagine when when it was yeah when yeah. it was just done, and now it's weathered. You know, God knows how many thousands and thousands of years later. It's uh, this it's a it's a marvel. This it's incredible. This is a. Is it protected by UNESCO at this point? Uh, it's recently discovered. And uh, I mean, the Ministry of Culture are doing amazing work, to be fair. And it's because of them, you know, that they that this has been recently published. And it uh, and the whole world, you know, was writing about it because no one expected humans 5,000, you know, years ago, 5,700 years ago, could build something such as this. And it was with, you know, the tools that they found were simple. It makes it more interesting. And this gives you... Use? What did they use? I believe it was some of them bone. There were bones and I believe uh, something with the... I think lithic, but I'm not 100% sure. But I do remember bones because like, hmm, that's interesting. So how many thousands of years ago did they predict that the camel carving was done? 5,700 to 5,400 BC. And you know when the pyramids, apparently according to National Geographic, when they were built? This is older than the pyramids, pyramids yeah. and Stonehead. And Stonehenge. And Stonehenge. The pyramids 4,500 years ago. This was 1,000 years before. This. this is the oldest in the world. Got me, well, I'm just going to start giggling as you talk. I mean, It's an actual size animal. So, you know, when I saw the, where the government was heading, and I remember I came up with this concept, I was, uh, I was just, you know, reading about, you know, I was interested at that time, and I was reading about, I believe it was an Asir region, about al Qatt al-Asiri. And then I saw how the story of it by itself is very beautiful. And it's usually when women, when a, someone gets married, and they, all the women gather to decorate her place, so they start to help her in painting in the house. So it was a woman kind of art. And then I said, you know what, what if we do an exhibition around the world? You know, you don't have to wait for people to come to you because we were recently open and you want to make the name of Saudi familiar. And the num one of the main factors why people travel is word of mouth. You've never want, I believe, you know, I mean, th th this applies on me, but usually you go to places when you know someone has been. And this is the, uh, because you trust their opinion, it's a personal experience. And if you get that name trending, and then if you do an interactive experience where people get to experience your culture just to give them a sense of comfort, that everything, everything's fine and it's... And this is when I did my master's in international... It was uh, international tourism, event, hosp event management, and hospitality. And I Say did, it again. 
international tourism. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, no, it's it's uh, it's 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 such a rich field. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like there say three times. <laughs> yeah, say three times. <laughs> so basically, what I did my thesis on it's how to promote touristic destination through through local heritage, through also for a person ha- to have an interactive experience. Because if you just go and you listen, five minutes you're gonna get bored. But if you get to interact, to when you get to interact and you get to be a part of it and get to learn without actually knowing that you're you're learning. This is where you will actually, a person will, ha- when you give a person an experience, they will never forget that. And this is what I try uh, to do. And, you know, and when you see it here, you know, you can also apply that on archaeological sites that we have, and especially that we have open air museums. Saudi is very rich in open air museums. And when you get to have an interactive experience at an open air museum, this is also a different kind of experience. And in Saudi, I got to have a lot of experiences, you know, whether it was in a, and, uh, you know, when you get to be a part of the culture or you want to go travel back in time and you want to, you know, visit ancient inscriptions to have a trip around the desert. It's also Saudi provides that. If you want to go to actual locations and see buildings, we also do provide that. So Saudi is a very interesting place to be. Even to me today, I still get fascinated. It's diverse. I'm very diverse. I've also went uh, last year to, or a few years, two years ago to... Uh, Khres Desert, and what's interesting about it, it was, it was called the Shark Teeth Trail. And I, millions of years ago, I, probably more than 20 million years ago, it used to be an ocean. So you find on the surface all of these uh, shark teeth fossils, and this is why it's called Shark Teeth Trail. And we found it on the surface, and it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. That's really, really cool. I need pictures of all of this. For sure. Promoting Saudi 101. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you checked out Ben Ali? Uh, it was amazing. I was actually, I went yesterday to visit to yeah i went yesterday with my friend first time yes first time it's incredible i i really loved the part of the islamic part when they had the them uh, and and i loved how they do did the, the, the drawings of the kaaba and to give you more of a visual that, that understanding was my favorite part and the column the wooden column yeah but wait just the 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 the, the line of or the penciling or the circumference the circumference is circular the line that illustrates how wide the Kaaba was and its growth over time. It was. I didn't know that. I thought the Kaaba was one size. Me too. I, I didn't know that. So that was very, very eye-opening and informative. Even when I saw the column, the wooden one, I, I, I was telling my friend, I said, I think it's this for the Kaaba. Was it inside? Because I, I, I kind of heard the man say it. And then she said, no, this is too tall. And then I said, yeah, because I never thought of a Kaaba being that tall. And yeah. he said, yeah, it's, it was inside. And I was, wow. Because when you see it, it when it's large, خلاص, you automatically assume it's large. But when you see one column, it gives you an actual size yeah. of how tall it is. Yeah, a reference. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing. You know, that's something we needed for the longest time. We needed a place where we can uh, show off our rich heritage and, and artifacts and pieces. And because there is so much but there was never a place to go to to see it. And Ben Ali really came at a very timely time. It was per Ministry of Culture, honestly, they're doing amazing Killing work. Just, just really, and next the, levels, e- next levels. Even when, and yesterday there was a concert. A concert? Well, yeah, in Ben Ali? Was, yeah, there was uh, this group called uh, something is Sharq. Okay. So it was beautiful. I mean, we didn't listen for the, for the entire... Uh, uh, for for we went inside because it was too crowded. But even the location, you really don't feel how crowded it is. No, no, no. You know when we were outside, it's like oh, it's so crowded. And then when you go inside, it's no yeah, yeah. The you way feel like you're the only ones there. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Really, is such a good job. I think it's it closes this week. I think it's the last week. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah. No, you caught it just in time. You know, it opened end of January. No, I actually didn't know about it. And now it's open. My friend was the one who told me about it. And I said, sure. And alhamdulillah, my friend told me. Yeah, no, good. You caught it, Justin. Thank you, Farah. Yeah, thank you, Farah. <laughs> what a friend. Okay. Um, 
Someone once told you not to stop and that your time will come. It's open-ended. You mentioned it when we got on a call uh, a week or two ago. Uh, can you just go into a little more, a little bit more details on, on that advice that you got from someone who told you, don't stop, keep going, your time will come? So this story, the reason that uh, this amazing woman told me this, it was after I graduated, probably around 2014 or 15, uh, so, you know, when you I, when you finish, you feel like, you know, everything you can do when you have this adrenaline after, you know, you finish your university. And I came for a meeting, it was a work meeting, and, uh, you know, they were asking me about my work and what I do and well, what kind of experience I have in, in the archaeological field than I did. And I remember when I finished and they were sitting, oh, sorry, at that time it was separated men and women, so a woman had to come with me, so she was sitting in the corner. And after we finished, I remember, you know, they sat, said, I don't know, you know, you're a woman and, you know, you were going to excavate in the desert and I don't know, you know, and, and they made it feel so difficult. And I said, but it's fine. It's my work. And they said, yeah, you know, why don't you work in the museum? And I said, thank you, but it's not my field of expertise. You know, I would intern at a museum. I don't mind it. But for me to work there, it's a completely different uh, field because, you know, you get to study certain artifacts, light exposure, and it's, it's a big world. And I'm not very familiar with it. And I said, thank you, but that's, that's not my field of expertise. This is, my, this is mostly what I do. And, you know, they said, yeah. And he told me something I'll never forget. He said, if you're insisting on excavating, you can do it in Jordan. And I said, okay, thank you for your time. And... You know, it felt like someone took, you know, my dream and they just shattered it in front of me. And as I was leaving the meeting, and it was very quiet. And then as soon as we left the room, the woman told me, Hassa, I've been in this room enough times. And I've never seen anyone come with, you know, your um, with the passion you have. And, and for someone who recently graduated, I had a pretty good CV. You know, my, my university provided us amazing programs with international universities. And she said, you know, um, please don't let their words affect you. You know, your your time is going to come. Just please don't don't let, don't listen to them. This is literally what she told me. And after I left, uh, I just you know, my mother called me, and then you know, I feel like if you hear your your mom is calm, the world is good. You know. And after I told her, he said, "So what? Continue. You're not going to let them stop you." She said, go anywhere in the world you want. And I'm also lucky, alhamdulillah, I'm privileged to have such a mother. And then after I arrived to the house, they called me again. And they said, if you want a sponsorship, you know, to study your master's, we can give you. Which is nice because maybe they didn't want to leave me, you know, leaving with nothing. But they told me, you know, you can do it on this site. And I said, yes, but the site has not been excavated and I cannot excavate it. So what will I write in my thesis? And they said, um, I don't know, you know, but this is an opportunity. I said, yeah, but, you know, even if someone did an archaeological survey, it's not enough for me to do a thesis on a site. And, you know, they said, yeah, I said, thank you. But, you know, I, I cannot even do it, you know, because there's nothing for me to, to study. And she's watching. I honestly forgot her name, but I never forgot her words. So thank you. That's amazing. And you know what's interesting is today when I get to see, you know, now, you know, you have female archaeologists and they're working every Yani in every part in Saudi. And it's alhamdulillah something amazing for me to see because what's normal to them was impossible for me. And this is something that I would say every time I see it, I get a little bit emotional because you know? Yeah, it's all free. Yeah, because alhamdulillah, to, to get to see that now, and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you want to make, you, you want everything to be better for the future generation. And it looks pretty good now, you know, in 2030, you know, you have everything. And even, you know, I never want to leave here. You know, every time I come, it's like, why should I leave? You know, we have everything. Now. Yeah, no, pe people who aren't from here are coming here. My friend came to visit me uh, this winter, actually. Uh, from Germany, and she's one of my best friends. And then she said, uh, she was she came for two weeks, and she said, "Why didn't you tell me it's like this? I want to live here now. How can I? How can I? How? Where do I apply?" And she was serious. 
And until today, you know, she really wants, and she's, she told me, خلاص, every winter I'm going to be here. And she loved it because, you know, she said, it's honestly the people. The people are amazing. And alhamdulillah. That's all about. You know, when someone goes on a trip to a country you've never been to, um, they typically first reflect on the food and, and then probably the people come in at number two. Yeah. Uh, or or some people would say, you know, no, the people were pricks, but the food was good. Or people were lovely. Yeah. Yeah. F- 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 the definitely the people play a role in the representation of the country and, and alhamdulillah our people really play such a positive role in in, mm-hmm. in uh, representing our country for the visitors that come and visit. Again, they come, you know, hospi- we come back to hospitality and, and that sensation for tourists. Honestly, it's in it's in our genes, you know, it's not something that we even have to learn or to, you no. know, it's just in our genes, you already have it. Even me, you know, when I go to any part of Saudi, I, I feel like I'm in Riyadh, I feel like I'm home. Everyone's nice, you know, when they know you're visiting, they want to give you everything. True. And it's, it's, it's heartwarming and everywhere feels home in Saudi. No, it's not just Riyadh, I swear every part in Saudi feels home. And I, and I, before I start speaking, I get mistaken for a non-Saudi. And they're very delicate with the, I think it's, you know, the, the green eyes. And uh, I mean, rarely has anyone ever guessed. I don't think anyone has ever guessed. And I play this game with people whenever I travel all the time. Oh, like, okay. where are you from? I'm like, take a guess. And I've never gotten Saudi. Um, so I feel it like from afar. And, That's and interesting. Obviously, if I'm not wearing a top, then there's no way they would. Yeah. Um, and then I and then I I see how nice they are. Then I start speaking, They're like Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, <laughs> Saudi and <laughs> good one, <Allah. laughs> yes, yes, Saudi. Um, you should say Allah, yeah, Allah, 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 Allah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. On a schooling level, I I don't think archaeology is taught yet in any school level globally, not just here. Mm. But what year do you feel that archaeology should be a topic where they're introducing it to students to see who has interest in the subject and who doesn't? You know, it's not introducing a topic as such as archaeology to be specific, but just to make people aware of, you know, the civilizations that has passed through our kingdom. Mm. And this is something I honestly saw in Jordan as uh, I lived there. Mashallah, you would ask anyone in the street and they would tell you the exact history of the Nabataeans. And they know, you know, if you go to Jarash, you would ask them, they would tell you, you know, this history of Jarash. And I do believe, you know, in Saudi, we should have, you know, more information about civilizations that that passed through our nation. And mashallah, again, we are very rich in history and we have a lot, even the things that are uncovered today. You know, interestingly, because, you know, I remember one of my cousins said, the boy, don't you excavate now? I said, after what I knew, know now, I can never excavate until I speak enough about what we have. Because, you know, I don't want to excavate and uncover what we still have a lot of covered history that's not being spoken about. And to just speak about what we, you know, what we have uncovered and what we have. And to share it, to, know, to let Saudis know about Saudi and the international world to know about Saudi. Mashallah, we're very rich. And I do believe we have a lot we can teach and, and can make it fun, you know, not so boring with numbers. And I try as much as I can to simplify the language for archaeology, not make it to, too boring with, you know, scientific terms. Yeah. Yeah. What is, would you say, like one of your best failures in life, something that has taught you the most? I wouldn't say, you know, failures, because I do believe we're supposed to fail to succeed. And in order, you know, to learn in life, you're supposed to to fail once, twice. And it's a way to learn how, you know, to do it again and to uh, not to do the same mistake. For me, I believe if you have a passion for something, not once would you ever get bored. Every failure would be, would be an experience. You will get to learn. And life is a journey and you're supposed to fail. And the thing is, we only see a person when they're successful, but we don't see the blood, sweat, and tears. We don't see their failures. You know, I, I failed several times and I've got my fair amount of rejections, you know. Some people would try to belittle you. Some people see that you're young. How can you be, you know, uh, you, you cannot have the knowledge that I have, even though they're superior and they have the upper hand. You know, as you move in life, you will stumble upon this kind of people, but it's fine at the end of the day. It's an, an, a person's opinion does not define you. Just 
you know, believe in yourself. And I do believe you create your own opportunity. So, you know, you, ha you have to fail. Does it feel like work or does it feel like play? Since the second I started pursuing archaeology, I never felt like I was studying. It felt like I was reading my favorite book. Work never felt like work. It was just, again, I was reading my favorite book, practicing, right. practicing my hobby, really never. That's when you know that you're doing what you want to do. It, I would say it's it's where I find my it's where I find my inner child. Yeah, you know the tilhasa appears here, and the thing is, my mother told me when, when you know we're in an archaeological site, and now it's it's the other way around. Now I'm the one giving her the information, and she just says, you know, whenever I see you in that space, I see see the younger version of you. Yeah. I see it in your eyes. You know that you still have the passion. Yeah. According to my mother. I love it. I love it. That's when you really know that you're mm. doing what you're supposed to do. Yeah. When you're enjoying it. When you look like a child when you're doing it. Yeah. I, I love it. I can never see myself anywhere but archaeology, honestly. It's beautiful. Uh, if you can go back and relive a moment from anything you've been through in life, what moment would that be? Mm -hmm. The first time my mother took me... My mother is very strict, so we were not allowed to skip any day in school. And I was in third grade, and she made me skip school to go with her to a field trip here in Riyadh. Uh, sorry, in Riyadh. Here we're in Jeddah. Yeah. And Riyadh. Are we? Yeah, we are. <laughs> she, Some days I don't know. <laughs> and she took me with her, so I was. So she allowed me to skip school, and I went with her to, uh, to the museum. And what's beautiful about it is she didn't tell me you're gonna. She just knew that something that's gonna excite me, and she took me with her, and I remember every piece in that museum until today it's one of the best honestly experiences i've ever had how old were you i think i was eight or nine years old wow you remember it i, I remember every class my, i attended with my mother wow and you know she would take me I remember she loves michelangelo and she would take me I remember we were at the vatican i think and then she took me by my hand and i was in a queue and she said come i want to show you something and she took me in the corner to show me Michelangelo's painting. And she would speak to me, you know, as an adult, how, why his brush strokes are so magnificent in his statues. And, and I, you know, and she would speak to me as if, you know, I, I know Michelangelo. And I actually knew because I attended her classes. But it was Hamdanda, something amazing to have. And the way she's, and the thing is, you know, if anyone who's watching who has parents or younger siblings, if you see your, child or your sibling you know they're 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 passionate about something you know invest in it couldn't agree with you more and but don't you know when when you speak to a kid as if he's a kid he knows it but when you speak to a kid as an adult he also knows it and he knows you're being serious with him and you're taking him seriously so th what my mother did with me is i think the main reason why i pursued what i love because I never felt like she, I was never taken seriously. She invested her time. She invested, you know, uh, anything. And as simple as, you know, making me skip, you know, school to go with her to a museum. That was an, an absolute amazing experience I had. Can I just take that point uh, a step further where you said that if you see your child interested in something, I would say that if you're a parent, it's your duty to go above and beyond finding out what it is your child is interested in. Not if you happen to find out what your child is interested in. No. Exactly. You need to know, push yourself, inquire, really have your, if you don't, put it this way, if you don't know what your child is interested in or what his areas of interests are, you're not close enough to your kid. Exactly. And this is, again, this is, my mother was the one who told me, you know, I should pursue our, she knew it. I didn't know it. You know, she was noticing everything ever since I was a ch ever since I was a child. Alhamdulillah, you know, I'm very blessed to have her. You know, such a mother, and uh, you know, she she always noticed. You know, to the I was eight or nine, and she noticed it. So Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all credit to her. Definitely. She's a. I swear, she has the kindest heart on this planet. She's amazing. Passion. A lot of people that come on the show, the majority, whenever they talk about their mom anyone who's ever brought up their mom on this show like their eyes just go 
watery and they, you know, refer to them in, in, in such a good way, really, I mean, moms in our region, they... They go above and beyond. Yeah, and and, I, and, and I spoke about it actually in the last episode, that, and I said that they don't make them like that anymore, the moms of, of our generation. Yeah. They are. They were special. They were like a a, a special <laughs> breed. Yeah, I agree with you. And alhamdulillah, I swear, you know, to me personally, my mother's who I aspire to be like. She's my role model, you know. And her advice is on small things. You know, she's a person I've never seen her scream not a day in my life. I swear to God, I've never seen her mad. She's always calm. And you know, her thing is what she says. Can I change it? If I'm mad, it's like, Mama, we have to do something. She says, is there something in my hands? Can I change it? I say, no. Then she says, accept it and move on. Khalas. You know, and it's that simple. Yani. Alhamdulillah, you know, I get to learn from her every day. She is my biggest fan. <laughs> and I'm forever uh, blessed to have her. And she's she's my source of motivation, honestly. If I was to ask you, what's your medicine in life? What would you say? My medicine in life? Mm. My mother. My mother is my life, honestly. She's my mother and my brother, I would say, you know, they are my life. They're, you know, they're my top priority in everything. And to always have them, you know, honestly, they're everything to me. This is, you know, words cannot describe it. Family, man, family, everything. Family first. A hundred percent. Thanks, uh, Hessa. How, uh, how did you think all that went? Was, uh, was there something that you wanted to add uh did we cover all the topics that you wanted to cover uh what do you think i don't know you do you have something that you think we should change or is there something that uh did not uh, no i mean we, we we hit on everything that i have written down here and then some uh do you feel like we should wrap up or is there a topic that, I, that you want me to formulate into a question for in, in for the sake of putting in everything as we can Honestly, I feel like everything, things I didn't expect came up. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. So <laughs> talk about everything. But, but, by the way, I think about an hour and 45 minutes. Really? 7.15, mm. yeah. And we also had, you know, to reduce some sentences. Yes. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, for my part, I mean, I think it, it went amazing, yeah. but, you know, yeah. did I say something, mispronounce something? No, 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 no. I <laughs> did very well. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Hessa, for introducing us to a world that I know very little about, that is all of a sudden an area of interest for me. And um, kind of like uh, an unsung or under-celebrated or under-excavated uh, area of, of our country and region. And really like, hopefully we have shed light on something that many people didn't know much about. So. Thank you for sharing all your stories. Thank you. Honestly, this makes me happy to be able to share what I love with the world and, and my passion. And this is honestly all that I've known ever since I was a kid. And I hope, you know, everyone enjoyed it. I hope someone learned and knew some new information about Saudi. And uh, thank you for having me. It was an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you. Pleasure is all mine, Hessa. Thank, thank you, you, Tim Horton. Thank you, Tim Horton. <laughs>